Barb Higgins here, welcoming you to A Thousand Tiny Steps. In this podcast, I share my stories of love, loss, triumphs, and tragedy as I continue to trace my steps backward and ponder what led to the death of my daughter, Molly. If you're ready to laugh, cry, shake your head in disbelief, or simply listen, and tie, buckle, slip on, or lace up your shoes, and join me as we begin our A Thousand Tiny Steps. Hey everybody, Barb Higgins here, welcoming you to episode 78 of A Thousand Tiny Steps. This has been a tricky set of episodes to record, as it just reminds me, you know, hindsight being 2020, it takes me back to a time I felt completely powerless, as I now know the full background of what was going on at the time. I had plenty of power. I just believed the people who told me I didn't. About a year after I lost my job, I filed a lawsuit against the district. And I was on the school board at the time. And and Roy was a big piece of helping me in this. And he was a big piece of Chris Rath justifying a lot of really unethical and illegal behaviors. But he was the gift of manipulation and had a very, very unethical attorney representing our district. And his lack of ethical nature, the whole loss firm, it was Solway and Hollis, which I think that loss firm is probably fine. But that was the law firm that represented the hospital in my medical malpractice suit. The attorneys from that place were horrifying. And this guy, the district's attorney, Ed Kaplan, did so many unethical things. I I just think back now and how he spoke and how he acted and what we were told as board members around things that had nothing to do with me. At any rate, I digress in the description of his lack of ethical behavior. During the time that this episode will share, I spent most of my time curled up in bed, horrified. I remember when Molly died, and I realized this was far worse than a job loss, but my job loss initially stung so much worse. And I think it's because it really truly came out of the blue. I didn't think it could truly happen. And I'd never had anything like that happen to me before. And I loved my job. It was my whole identity. It was everything that I had aspired for. And as I went along, after agreeing to resign and seeing all the people and the parts they played, it was horrifying. So to talk about it again is difficult, but it's important. I never actually, I take that back. I was going to say I never actually talked about it, but I did a radio show on WKXL in Concord, 2013 or 14, I think. And I told the whole story on radio. And I remember WKXL saying that was like one of the biggest episodes ever, the most people listening. And it was because every school teacher in the district was listening. The blanket of silence that Christine Rath created in our district, fear of helping, fear of doing the right thing, fear of upsetting the apple cart remains to this day sometimes. Our current superintendent just struggles with the board to have more faith in her. But there are enough board members with a remembrance of what it was like to function with Chris Rath that people just sit and they're quiet. It's really, really eye-opening to see the power certain people have. And if only good people could have the power, bad people did, the world would be a lot better off. I know that sounds whiny and judgmental on my part, but that's how people like this aim to manipulate the situation, make the victim look like the problem. The last episode ended with me waking up on Tuesday, November 2nd, not going to work. And I remember that day really, really clearly because I was horrified. I got up and I was in my pajamas I wasn't getting ready for school. Nobody really noticed that, meaning Molly and Gracie. I got them dressed. I dropped them off at school and I drove back home. And then I was just home all day. And I remember if a phrase comes to mind for me to describe November and December of 2010, it would be the silence is deafening. I didn't hear one word from anybody at Concord High School. Nothing. No one. No one reached out. No one asked who I was. Nothing. You know, I'd been there for seven years. It wasn't like I didn't have friends there and coworkers that were on my side, so to speak. So I don't know if Gene Connolly had a meeting or what he did, but the silence was horrifyingly deafening. And I spent those next 10 weeks or so going back and forth on what to do. Because I had tenure and because I didn't have anything in my personnel file saying I shouldn't be there, I had a good review the year before, I really could have thought. And I think had I gone before the full board and was able to go through everything that they were alleging, I don't think I could have legally lost my job. And I would have had the newspaper there. I really wanted it to be very public. And 
What worked on me to end up resigning was Chris Rath saying to me, if I win, and I will, you will lose everything. My pay would stop, my health insurance would stop, everything would stop on that day. By creating a separation agreement, which was supposed to be confidential, I was able to negotiate salary until you know, the end of that contract year, which was the following summer, and health insurance as well. So I received all of those things all the way to September 1st of the following year, 2011. I spent a lot of that year also trying to get my job back and hoping that I could. I didn't want to work anywhere else. Hindsight tells me I probably could have gotten another full-time job in another district. But the number of people giving me their two cents on what I should do was overwhelming, and it was paralyzing. And I spent most of November and December in bed. I drank a lot. I was just a mess. I was just a mess, such a mess, and I didn't know what to do. And I was scared all the time, really scared. And I had several meetings during these two months, meetings with the NEA, meetings with Chris Rath and all of those people. And every time I had a meeting, I had a whole new list of things that I had done wrong. For example, I was accused of not obeying custodian's orders and not having cords under doorways, across doorways in my classroom. And I didn't put them there. I showed up at the beginning of the school year and I'm like, what is this? And I was told by one of the custodians that, oh, don't worry, that's fine. And then I got written up for it. So I had to fight that, which I did. And that was taken off. And actually, Matt Cashman, who was the one that signed the nasty letter about me, apologized to me when I was elected to the school board. He came right up and apologized for his part in it. No one else did, but that's okay. They still have time. They still can. But I had a letter that said, I stole $50 a dance. So Lisa and I, I had mentioned before, we put on the homecoming dances. I volunteered at all the dances and I always brought the money to make change when kids were buying tickets at the door. And you had a vending company and had access to ones and fives. The number of dances I brought the till money to, and you always counted it out in front of somebody when you went home. And I just picture in my head now, Jean Connolly and Lisa Lamb sitting there together saying, here's how we can get her. Let's manipulate it. Because the letter that Lisa signed said that I made her watch me count it and she was afraid of me, which if you know Lisa Lamb, she's not afraid of anybody. And I was accused of stealing $50 like in front of people. But it was in a ton of these. This woman named Deb Jor, she still works in the district and I'm sure she's a wonderful person, but she wrote a letter claiming that she was put in the middle because I showed up late all the time. She always saw me come in late. And she's right. Two days a week, I had a planning period first 45 minutes of the day. I said to Jean Connolly, principal at the time, but I please drop Molly and Gracie off at their respective schools that they were in. And he said, yes, just check in the main office when you get back, which I did every time, which is why Deb Jor knew I came in at 8, 10, two days a week. Now, did I have this in writing? No. Hindsight tells me I should have had it in writing that it was okay. These are things I thought I could fight and probably could have. And I'm quite sure in public, on TV, in front of newspaper reporters and everything, that it would have been harder for these women to maintain their lives. I know that Deb Jor couldn't look me in the face for a long time, and I don't ever see her now, but she never reached out and apologized. Things like that were happening all the time. That teacher's aide said that I swore all the time. That was fine. That was another step with a fork. In future episodes, and actually I'll refer you all to the Patch website because I, I wrote about it. But essentially, every time I went to visit my attorney and every time I spoke with Mike Macri, who was the union president, Mike said, please fight it, please fight it, please fight it. The NEA said, please fight it. That's the National Education Association, New Hampshire version. But they farmed me out. I had a great attorney at the NEA, and then I got farmed out to this guy named Glenn Miller. And I used to see him all the time at Cheers. He sat at the bar there five days, seven days a week. And when I first saw him, I was excited. But I realize now that he was in cahoots with Ed Kaplan, who was the attorney for the district. This he started to spew things. He started using RSAs against me that were supposed to protect me. And RSA is like a public law that's developed by the legislature. So teachers, are they work for the public. So they have to follow all these statutes, state statutes. And so all of a sudden, the ones he was using for me, he started using against me. Like, this is not going to work. And one time he just said, look, you need, to, you need to resign. You need to resign. And I'm just like, I thought you were here to represent me and help me keep my job. And he just would get silent at those times. He goes, here, this one's really going to get you. He'd, he'd pull one out. And it was me coming in late two days a week. And, and then there was the email thing. And these were all things that I could cite. The principal that I'd been talking about and not remembering her name was Susan Noyes. And I remember it now because I was in one of the articles. I've been rereading the articles that I wrote. She was the one that told me to keep everything on public email. 
And I remember now that during, there was a guardian of litem, which is an attorney that represents the children in any, any contentious divorce case. And there was a GAL and she asked me if I would speak to the guardian at litem on behalf of Morgan and Teresa. And of course I would. The attorney, it was the attorney's job to assess the environment and the safety of the environment. And she caught right on to Amy and Bob and how what they said didn't match that environment. And so this was another reason that Amy and Bob were mad at me and went to Chris Rath to complain. And I didn't, I did not remember this part. And I went in to see Chris Rath. Not only had she heard the email thing, but Amy and Bob had said that I had gone against them and broken confidentiality by talking to a guardian at Lightham and complained about Susan Noyes as well. If ever there was a time that Chris Rath should have fought for her employee and not for some woman that she's never met who's playing, making all these claims, it was then. But Chris Rath, they're all the same. I look at Amy, Bob, to some extent, Roy and Chris as all being different versions of the same. They all had an agenda that they wanted and it didn't matter who they hurt to get it. And if that sounds harsh, I apologize. Yes, you could say I had an agenda. My agenda was to keep my job. My agenda had been to help the kids. Was I innocent? No, I jumped into a relationship with Roy. I will never, ever say I didn't take part in that willingly. I very willingly helped him. But I didn't think to myself, I'm going to screw over Amy and Bob. No, it was these children need to have a decision made on their behalf by the legal system and his family court in New Hampshire so that they, they have the best possible life. That was my agenda. I guess, you know, those involved in this on the other side could say that I didn't care who I hurt doing it. But frankly, the children come first. So if the truth hurts the person that's lying, then I guess I'm willing to, I'm willing to take, say that, yes, I didn't care who I hurt. Except that wasn't my motivation. You know, I'm a lot of things, but I have never in my life, never in my life woken up and thought, hmm, how can I hurt so-and-so today? Ever, ever. And so... The fact that so many people were willing to take that mindset against me in this situation is hurt, hurt. And it follows me in my life. The longer I podcast and the more stories I tell, you'll all start to wonder, how could I be so stupid? Sometimes I think I just am. You know, when it comes to reading the negativity that people have toward me, you know, I'm just very easily caught up. If that doesn't make me a martyr, that's not my point either. So back to the matter. So every week or so, there would be a meeting all through November, December. And then it sort of ended over at Christmas vacation. I had like a two week break from it all. And then the hearing date was set mid January and early February or whatever. I said I wanted public hearings. And so it would have been the full school board and, and everything else. And I really, that's what I wanted to do. But my legal, my legal team was not helping me. And then I went back to the NEA and complained. He farmed me out to a tool. He's not a good attorney. He's trying to convince me to resign. Is that what you all want me to do? You want me to resign? Tell me, like, and, and I just felt that people had just sort of washed their hands of it. And I think this is how Chris Rath, there's 10 of us. In the, my lawsuit against the district a couple of years later, there were nine other people besides me under the 10 years that Chris Rath was superintendent or 15 or whatever, that there were separation agreements. That was probably one of my worst, you know, 2010 holiday seasons ever because I wasn't working. Now, I had plenty of time to be with Gracie and Molly. That was fine, but they knew I wasn't right. And then I assumed everybody knew, but of course, nobody knew anything because that's how Chris Rath functioned. She just kept things quiet. She didn't tell board members. You know, I remember talking to Clint Cogswell after my whole public resignation and he looked at me and said, what happened? And I'm like, you don't know? And Chris Rath made it sound like the whole board was against me. And that was one of the reasons for sort of deciding to run for school board, to really see how it worked and what, what could have I, what could have happened? So coming in late, using the F-bomb, <laughs> there was the whole shaking in front of the window thing, like I had inappropriately boogied in front of students, okay? <laughs> I was in my late 40s at the time. No high school student's going to want to watch me boogie in front of a window. There were five or six or seven, and the specifics of it aren't important. The bottom line is my attorney said they're stabbing you to death in the fort, and they could potentially win. Hootja Club, stealing money, you know, not going to the meetings I was supposed to go to not following curriculum. Like it just made things up over and over and over again, you know, and then coming back too soon for a medical leave. Well, that's not something I should lose my job over. They should have increased my medical leave. So all of these things were, were sent into play. And so what I did on January 6th, 2011, is I resigned. 
And I remember when I went to my attorney and said, okay, I think I've decided to resign. He was like, oh, right. And you could just tell that, that he felt he'd won. I remember sitting there thinking, all right, I actually should say, forget it. I changed my mind. It's clear that this is what you want. I want to know why. You know, and he would say that he spoke with Ed Kaplan. And I just think there was a monetary gain for him as well. In my lawsuit years later, you know, suing, sort of suing the NEA and, and suing the district and getting money from the NEA to sue the district, he went out of business. He, he was no longer practicing. And I believe in part and parcel to my lawsuit because, because my lawsuit claimed that I had been, you know, farmed out and given crappy coverage. I went to a wonderful attorney named Don Meyer and he went, looked through everything and said, I absolutely had enough to sue a school district. And we put a lawsuit together and I delivered it and it was read at a school board meeting. This was all several years later. Again, I ran ahead. At the time, not knowing the magnitude of Amy and Bob's involvement, not knowing the magnitude of what would come to be Roy's involvement, or lack of support and prevention at the time, I was paralyzed. And he was also distraught. I didn't know our financial issues around his business were still as bad as they were. And so he was utterly panicked. I didn't know. Had I known, it would have been worse. So I make the decision to resign. And I remember at the time that Roy really wanted me to fight and he wanted to come there and be a part of the fight. And I would have let him. I mean, he's articulate in that way. And they would be hard pressed to talk about an affair in front of a newspaper. You know, everyone raise your hand if you've never had an affair, that the number of school district members that were having an affair at that time, I think they'll get nervous. Don't worry, everyone, I'm not going to say your names, <laughs> but I could, and they wouldn't be able to say it wasn't happening. So at any rate, a couple of other things happened during that time that made me realize just how evil Gene Connolly had become or how wrapped up in the Chris Rath he was. Chris Rath, she's horrible, but she wielded control and power over people. And so people were just quiet. The people, Lisa Lamb and Gene Connolly, the teaching assistant and Ben Green, one of the NEA building reps that represented me, Bob, they were all just seemed complicit in everything that was going on. I think some of the people that Chris Rath got to write letters, Matt Catchman, for example, Steve Mello, the athletic director, Deb Jory, that person I talked about. I think all of that at the time were flying monkeys. And they do it because it's either out of fear or out of some loyalty. Maybe they have negative feelings against the person or they, they have some connection. Chris Rath was masterful at this. So the first week of my suspension, it was grade week. And I had final exams that I had given that needed to be corrected. There are 100 questions and you just put them through this thing called a scan program and it corrects in 10 minutes. So I asked permission. Can I please correct my exams? Yes. I'll go to the high school at four o'clock. Can somebody meet me? So I, there were no more kids in the high school. I went straight to my classroom. The assistant principal that was there to watch me, Adam Osborne, came with the scantron and I was just getting started. And Gene Connolly came up and started yelling at me, get out of this building. I'm like, Gene, I have 150 exams. I'll be 10 minutes. Please, I, if I have to score these by hand, I was still thinking I could get my job back. So not scoring the exams was out of realm for me. I felt like I had to do it. He refused to let me do it with a Scantron. I should have taken the Scantron home or left it and asked someone to do it. I don't know. But I, I spent an entire weekend scoring 150 exams by hand. That is what Gene Connolly participated in. I should note when I finally, I went to get a lot of my belongings out. I believe this was after I had agreed to resign. So I went with Kenny and it was a Saturday and I was told that I had to have somebody in the room with me. So Steve Rothenberg was there. And he's like, I'm not going to sit up here. You're fine. And I said, no, no, no. I don't want anything against me. You are going to stay here. And he goes, well, Gene's downstairs. And I'm like, well, tell him to come up here. He wouldn't come up. He refused to come up. But he did say, it's fine. You can get your stuff out. You don't need us watching you. And Kenny and I emptied my classroom. And I put it all in the barn. And that's where most of it stays. And it was, it was just horrifyingly sad because I was leaving something that I loved. And there was no reason for it. Yes, Amy and Bob could jump up and down when they read in the newspaper that I had resigned. I'm a good teacher and I'm an unbelievable coach. Concord High School track and cross country has tanked since I left. And if I sound full of myself, well, then maybe I am in those things. I was a very good coach. The biggest cross country team since I left is probably 15 or 16 girl. And yes, they've had one or two state titles, but they should have had, looking at the talent that, that those teams have had, those girls were legit. It's bad for me. And Jean's daughter, Allie, is now the coach. So <laughs> go figure. At any rate, all of these things were happening. I had to empty my classroom. You know, I was being yelled at for 
grading exams. And I, I graded everything because I just felt like that, that way they couldn't screw me over. They couldn't take away my email and internet and all that. So during the two months that I was home, I forwarded myself every email from my school email to my personal email so that there was never, they couldn't like disappear things. I also know that I could request a right to know all those things still exist and I could get all of those things. And I may do that as I continue the podcast journey and writing my books. So as decimating as November and December were in terms of just lying still on my bed and being horrified, I also did sort of start to put together ways of, if not fighting, at least protecting myself somewhat. I submitted my resignation. And for my resignation, I got a letter of recommendation from Chris Rath. I got a full-time pay all the way to September 1st of 2011, and I had medical insurance. Hindsight tells me I should have worked much harder to get another job that had medical insurance, but I got sort of sucked in with my next person who eyed me as the perfect next person. I resign. And again, I wake up every day and I take Gracie and Molly to school and I come home and I just lie in bed and I'm just beside myself. I started timing a ton of road races. I had to bring a letter, my letter of recommendation and my letter of list of things, transgressions that I did wrong to Larry Martin, who was president of the indoor track committee. And I started officiating at track meets. I wasn't coaching anymore. So I started officiating and that's good money and it's cash money. And so I worked all winter officiating track meets. And then I, in the spring and summer, I got way into timing road races again. I timed like 30, 40 events and at a hundred bucks an event, you know, that was several thousand dollars. So I started to piece together money for myself, not enough to pay all the bills, but enough to cushion up like a savings account. And I also put money aside to pay the bills as they came. But, you know, Molly and Gracie were dance competitions. I didn't want their lives to end. And I worked really hard for that not to happen. During this time, 2011, Roy's divorce was now final. And he was, you know, full-time, didn't have to come up to Concord much. I believe the house had sold. He had gotten the belongings that he was supposed to get. I think it took a while, but he had gotten everything that he was supposed to have. And I remember it was maybe March or April of 2011. So I had just lost my job and it was maybe two months later. And we were sitting in my car outside of Rite Aid Pharmacy in Concord and we had gone to dinner. And he looked at me and he goes, you know, I don't know how much longer I can do this. And I'm like, do what? So now all of a sudden, because his divorce was final, our relationship was no longer like, okay, it's like, all right. I can't do this anymore. And it wasn't, how can we get you stable so that we can continue? It was, look, I'm done. I'm going to end this now. I've lost everything. <laughs> this would play itself out again after Molly's death. But at the time, I remember sitting in the car in my heart, pounding like, no, 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 no. no. And it was, it was just a time where it wasn't only, I just felt like I couldn't lose that too. Like my marriage was in shambles. It wasn't a marriage. It hadn't been a marriage now for a couple of years. And now I was, I had lost a 21 year teaching career. I knew that I had heard about how excited and jumping around Amy and Bob were through Teresa, and she was mortified by it. Like, what? Because of that church connection. And I actually heard a lot from Mary, my church friend. She was very protective of Teresa and didn't want her sort of put in the middle and in trouble on either side. So she kept us pretty, us meaning Roy and I, up to date on, on the reality of life in this other town that the girls were now living in. But at that time, I was just like, this all happened because I helped you. You don't get to leave me. This is not okay. And so he didn't. I have to be clear. Roy lives the life he wants to live. He had a lot of freedom and a lot of alone time. Over the years, when we were on again, off again, I don't want anyone to think I was like having the best of both worlds because I know that that's what it could potentially look like. But I had the worst of both worlds. I didn't actually have a relationship with Roy and I didn't have a marriage. I didn't have anything. Everything I had was fake. And I'm going to own it. I'm going to own my part of not doing what I should do to fix my life. I should have done that. And I didn't. Job loss. Well, suspension. November, December. Drinking, throwing up, crying, sleeping, fighting, accusations. What to do next? What to do next? Then finally resigning. Then putting together a life knowing that I resigned. When I think of the winter of 2011, what I think of most is the amount of time I spent with Gracie and Molly. I wasn't sure what was going to happen in any level of my life. Would I stay living with Kenny? Would we lose everything? Would I have to uproot Gracie and Molly? 
raise them somewhere else. When I moved to Massachusetts and lived with Roy, you know, I didn't know. I didn't know what was, what was coming. And so I spent a ton of time with Gracie and Molly. I brought them to school. I picked them up. I was sad. And one of the things that made me sort of turn around and change my, my outlook was Gracie came in one morning and I was still lying in bed. And she was, she was just sad. And I said, Gracie, honey, what's the matter? And she just started sobbing. And she just, her shoulders, she had this little haircut and her shoulders went down. And she goes, mommy, you're just so sad all the time. I want you to be happy again. And, and I was not happy. I haven't truly been happy, happy for a long time. I pulled her into bed with me. She was wearing these brown little flannel jammies that they were Christmas jammies, I think. Just hugged her. I would be happier. I put that on. So February vacation of 2011, Gracie and Molly and I were all fighting some sort of little stomach bug, but every day we get up and did something. We went to the Sea Science Center. We went to the movies. We went out to eat. We went to the Christmas McAuliffe Auto Planetarium. Molly and I both got really dizzy. Every day we did something, and every day at about 3.30, one of us didn't feel good. We'd comb, and by dinner time, we'd get into bed, in the big bed, and we'd put on movies, and we'd watch Disney movies. We watched so many movies that week. It actually... When I look back at their childhood, it was such a bad time for me. And it was one of the best weeks ever. I just did everything with them. And that began habit that I continued. I went on field trips. I did all of it. I was in school all the time with them. All the way through until Molly's death, I had a schedule that allowed me to be with them. So in that regard, my life is always some things are good and some things are horrible. At that time period, I was able to parcel together some good times. Another thing that was a positive out of all that was my relationship with my sister, Johanna, because she was always jonesing for money and she timed a lot of races. And so we were able to do a ton of race timing, which was helpful. So long after I'd lost my job, not even long after, months after, two times I had to go to court and request a restraining order against Amy and Bob. And I was in fact awarded one and then awarded an extension because of their unbelievable harassment of me long after I'd lost my job and had nothing to do with them. And it was primarily Bob, although how Bob would have any feelings about me without Amy feeding them makes no sense. He's not somebody that was ever a part of my life. So I remember seeing all these things and realizing what set up Chris Rath's hatred of me was a way for her to get around her actual reason, which was that I spoke out against the bill of demolition. My speaking out caused the project at Kristen McAuliffe School that increase quite a bit and be changed because of some architectural things I pointed out. They would have had to be changed anyway, but she could blame this on me. I was like the catalyst that got that going. So I am quite sure she was furious about that and also quite sure she had to have something else to really fuel the reasons for me being fired or her wanting me gone. And Amy and Bob's timing was flawless. This is also why I feel that Roy was connected to this somehow because it's all too perfect to be coincidence. And I just think, not that the three of them were colluding to have me lose my job. I just think they all were talking to each other about what was going on because Amy and Bob knew too much about me that they shouldn't have been able to know. So that's sort of how I feel. So I write that the events of the spring and summer of 2010 were the perfect storm. I opposed the building demolition. I have the email complaint at this medical leave I took. All of this made me look like an unstable teacher and staff person. And the other ammunition, I said yes. I always say yes. I have no one to blame but myself for giving her that ammunition. I said yes. I said yes to taking the medical leave when Jean Connolly suggested it. I didn't really need it, but I said yes. I said yes to speaking out publicly about the building demolitions to Roy. It was his idea. I didn't want the buildings to be torn down, but I had no plans to speak out. And he pushed it and pushed it. He would check in with me all the time. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you at with that? And I said yes to putting all that stuff with the restraining order on school district email. I could have done it on my own private email. I just never said no, even when I felt like I should. And that's where I have to take, I have to take ownership. I learned after the fact that a lot of Amy and Bob's anger at me was me helping the attorneys representing the children. Of course, Bob is going to support Amy, which is, you know, when you look at them as a couple, they support one another. They have each other's backs. And so he was taking care of his soon-to-be wife. Good for her. She found someone that loves her enough to do that. Initially, I have to say, when I got all the paperwork from the guardian at Lightham, Kenny and I said, no way, and we threw it away. I didn't want to be a part of it. And then it was Sue Noyes who called me on the phone and said, please, please leave me out of it. And she said, how about if I give the guardian at Lightham 
your email address. So she gave the GAL my school email address. And I met with this woman at Concord High School and at Kimball School. And I spoke to her a long time and gave her my side and my observations. Because I did that on my school email, Chris Rath was willing to say that Amy was right, that I had used school email to harass her. You know, I had used school email to protect two children who I thought were in danger. So anyway, back to really the six month period that I'm talking about, I learned as the months and years went on, just how stupid I had been and how gullible I had believed people. I had just made the classic mistake. It's hard to undo that kind of behavior. I've done it again and again. So this podcast will sort of end with the summer of 2011. Remember, 2009 was like the best summer ever. 2010, things were beginning to crumble. 2011, <laughs> I had been out of work really for a year. When I think back, and this is sort of, you know, lucky me, financially speaking, I had the month of June in 2010 off and I had the summer off. I mean that, you know, so I had pay all that time. I went back to school for all of September and all of October. And then I didn't work again. From June 1st, 2010 to September 1st, 2011, 15 months, I only worked three of those months. I got paid for a full year and I didn't work. In terms of a separation agreement in and of itself, I did fine. I had medical insurance all that time for Gracie and Molly. For all of us, family insurance, I did fine. But come to the summer of 2011, I went back and spent 4th of July again with Roy in Massachusetts. We continued to have visits and time together. Now, things were definitely strained, but I also know that it appeared to me at the time that Roy really was fighting for me. He jumped in and really, he had a lot more time than I did. I was, I was working like eight part-time jobs. I was seven days a week, you know, then getting Molly and Gracie places. And I was, you know, Kenny was working 60 hours a week. You know, I just was busy all the time, really, really struggling and busy. And there was no pocket connection anymore. So if Roy and I were going to see each other, I had to figure out a way to get to him. And so I did again and again. The summer of 2011, I believe it was the first time that we had not gone to the Jersey Shore in a long time. I had track camp still. I did a lot of things. I remember I had to go to Parks and Rec and make sure it was okay to have track camp. Chris Rath tried to stop it. She realized she couldn't. That was a little bit of a victory for me as well. But it was just tough. It was really tricky and tough to navigate, you know, watching the track teams compete and all of the things that I should be doing wasn't doing. And it was really hard for me. So in a two-year period of time, I had gone from on top of the world to very, very much the bottom of the world. And my situation with Roy was now very, very different to navigate because he was now divorced. So he was essentially free. He didn't have to stay with me and support me and wait for me. My point to him was that if it weren't for him and me deciding to help him, I wouldn't have lost my job. I wouldn't be in the situation I was in. If I had just taken the damn keys and said, I can't help you, in July of 2009, none of this would have happened to me. All of it would have just disappeared for me. So in that regard, a huge regret for me that I helped him. In terms of the children, to some extent, I'm glad I did it because it did get them back into visiting Roy much sooner than they would have. And it gave them, it gave Teresa, I think, a little bit of a glimmer of hope, knowing that, that somewhere out there, people were fighting for her. I'll end here. This is also when I started to apply for some other jobs in some other districts. And I actually was given a couple of interviews. And that's when I decided to work at VLAX, which is the Virtual Learning Academy, Academy Charter School, which is where I work now. I was still tap dancing because it was something that was really, really helpful to me, where I would sometimes come and watch me tap dance. It was kind of funny. And the girls were still dancing and doing dance camp. And I was, I was working a thousand jobs. So, you know, to some extent, that was fine. I, I was pulling myself together and getting my life back together. But it was the beginning of, of a phase of my life that would last for years that was really built on instability. It's a time in my life that I look back on like, wow, how did this happen? But there's always a pretty major thing that connected Roy and me together. And for the next couple of years, it would be the school district and the lawsuit. As always, be good to yourself. Be good to someone else after you're good to yourself. And as always, have a good day, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening and for supporting the podcast. Feel free to leave a review and to share my stories with your friends. Please reach out with your own stories. I love connecting with my listeners. If you want to see what I'm up to next, you can find me on Instagram at Barb underscore 444, on Facebook as Barb Higgins, and at my website, a thousandtinysteps.com. And while you're there, sign up for my newsletter 
a weekly way to find out what's up in the life of Barb Higgins. <laughs>